Good morning. Ooh, a little feedback there. There wasn't any before. I'm louder when I'm saying good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Welcome to worship at uh, Edison Lutheran this morning. Uh, it's, yeah, it's good to have you all here. Uh, as I, uh, just a couple notes on the service. We uh, will be, uh, our, our reading will come from uh, John chapter 1. We're going to be hearing about the uh, calling of a couple of disciples following Jesus. This is early in his ministry, early before uh, his ministry has gotten off the ground. Uh, he's just sort of setting things up. So that's where our focus will be uh, text-wise this morning. Um, if you haven't been here uh, for these before, if you haven't used these uh, uh, little communion packets that we have, I just want to direct your attention to that there's two lids on top. There's a clear uh, uh, cover that gets to the uh, wafer, the bread, and then the foil lid uh, underneath that, which gets you to uh, the grape juice, uh, or the, they're all grape juice uh, for in the cup there. There'll be more uh, instructions on that when we come to the communion portion of the service. Um, before we begin uh, worship, I want to uh, highlight a few uh, prayer uh, announcements um, that we can be holding in prayer, one of which is a thanksgiving. Uh, so the first thanks, uh, the thanksgiving that I want to share uh, is that uh, Butch and Jeannie Hertz uh, are here this morning with us in worship. So Butch had a stroke, uh, boy, how long has it been? Almost two months ago now, a month and a half, and uh, this is his first time being back in worship with us. So let's, I want to welcome them. Can we give a little honk to... Good to have them back with us. Um, and then I have a couple other prayer uh, concerns uh, to lift up for you. We have two members uh, of our church. If uh, you're part of the prayer chain, you've seen this, but we have two members who are currently on hospice care. Uh, so uh, Lorraine Gunderson, as well as Neva Lead, are both on hospice care right now. Uh, and so I ask that you would keep them in prayer, uh, keep their families in prayer, their loved ones, uh, our whole congregation um, as uh, as, as we are accompanying them uh, in prayer, even if we can't be with them in person uh, during this time. Now I invite you to take a moment and to uh, let the, the worries of the day, the worries of the week, of the year, uh, to go uh, away, to set them aside, uh, and to take a moment to find the quiet place and to prepare yourself and to prepare uh, your surroundings uh, to hear God's word for you this morning. And I invite you to do that as we listen to our prelude. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is In Christ Called to Baptize. We will sing verses 1 and 3. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, day by day praising you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Samuel, chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called for me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went down and went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel. Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Our psalm comes from Psalm 139, and this is what our tone uh, will be. Lord, you have searched me out, O Lord, you known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret 
and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it can be summed up as saying, what you do with your body matters, because your body matters to God. Paul writes, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord is meant for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said the two shall become one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. In the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, whom Jesus had already called. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. I imagine Nathaniel sitting there with his back against the tree, maybe resting after a day of work, looking out at the vista before him, one that perhaps included his village, the busyness, but from a distance, or, or the Sea of Galilee beyond it. And I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder what his mindset may have been. Was he contented as he sat there? enjoying the rest, enjoying the stillness, enjoying the view before him? Or was he preoccupied? Was his mind busy with the worries of the day? The worries of daily life, the worries of, of work and village life, of family squabbles, of uh, social divisions? Or was he preoccupied with larger matters? with the politics of his day? Was he preoccupied with the fact that his people, the Jewish people, were divided? 
They were divided geographically, but also socially. That he living up in Galilee in the north was distant from his fellow Jews living in Judea, in, uh, where Jerusalem was located in the south. And was he troubled that because of this geographic distance, there was a division between these Jews in Judea and these Jews in Galilee, that those who were at Jerusalem at the centers of power regarded those up river, up the Jordan River in Galilee as someone to be looked down on, those who lived out in the backwater, those whose motives were suspect because not only Jews lived there, but Greeks as well. They were mixed in together very often. Was he concerned about the various factions that were pulling his people apart? The Pharisees on the one hand, out among the common people, the, the Sadducees on the other hand, centered in Jerusalem among the elites and the priests somewhere in between? Was he worried about the zealots, those out in the wilderness, who would every so often, every few years or so, build up the, a band of raiders, of, of rebels, of, of militia, and come and try and drive out the Romans uh, from their midst, the Romans who would respond violently? Was he worried about the Romans? For more than, a, or for almost a century, most of a century, the Romans had occupied Galilee and had occupied Judea and had installed their own rulers, their own leaders, leaders who were very often corrupt, leaders who were there to maintain, maintain the peace, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, a peace that was important in order to make sure the tax revenue flowed, that the tribute could be extracted from the peoples in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Galilee, and sent off to the emperor, to the Caesar, in Rome. Was Nathaniel preoccupied with the situation of his day? And if he was, did he expect that something would happen to change it? Was he expecting, awaiting a savior? Was he expecting, awaiting a Messiah? One who would come and restore the religious life of the Jewish people. One who would come and restore the right authority, the right rulers, and kick out the Romans. Was he waiting for someone to come as he sat there alone under this fig tree? Except he wasn't alone, was he? Nathaniel doesn't know it, but as he's sitting there doing whatever it is he's doing under this tree, he is being watched. He has been seen. He is being sought out by Jesus, who is seeking disciples to work with him in his ministry. Jesus has decided to go to Galilee, and he goes to Galilee, and he finds Philip. And Philip, whether because he's sent explicitly by Jesus or just goes of his own accord, we're not told, goes and finds his brother Nathaniel as Nathaniel is sitting under this fig tree. And Philip interrupts Nathaniel's thought or Nathaniel's nap or, or whatever is happening. He interrupts him with this word, we have found the one who Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets. That is, we have found the one who is promised in scripture. We have found the Messiah, the savior, the one who will put all these things right. But of course, Philip's not quite right when he says that because it says very clearly in the first verse of our text, Jesus has found them. Jesus finds Philip. Philip didn't find Jesus. Jesus finds Philip. And as Philip goes to Nathanael and we find out that Jesus has already been watching Nathanael, has seen Nathanael, uh, whether from a, a distance, but more likely miraculously somehow through the spirit, we could say. It turns out Nathanael has been found by Jesus as well. Now, this is a surprise. Whether Nathaniel was expecting this or not, whether Nathaniel was uh, ready for this or not, it's a surprise. It's a surprise because of who this person is. Jesus, son of Joseph, uh, Philip says, of Nazareth. And Nathaniel responds, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I don't know if Nathaniel is meaning to look down negatively on, on Nazareth or if he's just expressing honest surprise that the Messiah, the one promised, might come from such a place as Nazareth. 
I mean, the idea that the Messiah would come out of Galilee is already a surprise. Galilee, remember, is the backwater. It is up the Jordan River from Jerusalem. It is not where you expect the Messiah to be. The Messiah should be in Jerusalem, at the temple, at the center of things. So that in itself is a surprise. But even more so of all the towns and the villages of Nazareth, some of which even have some commercial importance beyond uh, the, the Jewish uh, nation, why Nazareth, of all places, this village of, of maybe 200 people uh, tucked away up in the hills, quite remote, a, a village where people uh, literally dig into the soft rock of the hillside to build their houses. They're, they're cave dwellers of a sort up there in Nazareth. Of all the places that the Messiah is to come from, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can this good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel is surprised. Jesus is finding them, seeking out these ones who are surprised at who he is. Philip doesn't try and reason with Nathaniel. He doesn't go to scripture to try and prove that, of course, the Messiah uh, should come from Nazareth. He doesn't say, well, you know, the Messiah might be interested in starting at the edges and working his way. And he doesn't offer any arguments at all. Philip seems to actually, uh, by not trying to defend it, acknowledge that this isn't really a defensible statement. It doesn't make any sense that the Messiah would be from Nazareth. And so Philip does the only thing he can do. He invites him to come and to see. This can't be defended logically. This can't be explained rationally. It just is. And Philip doesn't know why, but he invites his brother, come come and see. And so Nathaniel comes and sees, and he finds out in his interaction with Jesus that Jesus has been the one seeing him this whole time. Here is an Israelite truly in whom there is no deceit. Here is someone who is simple and straightforward, who calls things like he sees them. And Nathaniel is shocked. How did you know me? How do you know this about me? And Jesus says, well, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel believes. And then at the end, there's this uh, strange kind of statement that Jesus makes. It seems to come kind of out of nowhere. I mean, he says, you'll see greater things than this. But then he says, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angel of God, angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And then it ends and it moves on to the next story, the, the wedding of, at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. And this one little statement kind of sticks out there at the end. It doesn't seem to obviously connect with what came immediately before. It certainly doesn't seem to connect with what comes immediately after. It's not obvious in our English translation, but in Greek, you can see that the you here, the I tell you, you will see, is plural. Jesus is speaking all of a sudden to more than one person. Everything so far has been between him and Nathaniel, but now he's including more people in the statement about you will see. It kind of sticks out. It's, it's surprising. Uh, maybe Jesus is, is now including Philip or Andrew and Peter, the others who are there. Maybe Jesus is now including us, the hearers of this gospel, the readers of this gospel. It's not the only time something like that happens in John's gospel. You will see. But if our ears are perked up, and certainly Nathaniel's and Philip's would have been, you might notice something familiar about that statement, about angels ascending and descending. A couple of months ago, I think, a few months ago, back in the fall anyway, we heard a text uh, from Genesis uh, chapter uh, 28, uh, a text involving Jacob. Jacob was on the run from his brother Esau, as you may recall. He was, had stolen his brother's birthright, and his brother was murderously angry at him. And Jacob is on his way out of the land. He is running for his life, and he comes to a place, and he lays down, and he uh, uses a stone as his pillow. He doesn't have anything with him. And as he sleeps there, he has this vision. I just want to read part of this vision. He dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were uh, ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you will lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And then he goes on, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob wakes from his sleep and says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. 
How similar that is to Nathaniel's experience. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place in Galilee of all places, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place in Nazareth of all villages, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord was with me under this fig tree, and I did not know it. You will see this, Jesus says. Now, there's something very profound here. Because just as Jacob assumes this is the place where God dwells, this is the gates of heaven, this is the place where heaven and earth meets, and actually tradition then goes on to say that this is the site of where the temple in Jerusalem is built, that over, you know, generations, centuries later, the, the temple is built on the same exact spot. This is what the tradition says. Jesus now says, you will see that same thing happening on me. Jesus says, I now am the place where heaven and earth meet. I now, wherever I am, as the gate of heaven, where the angels are ascending and descending, where God is standing and making a promise that I will be with you. I will not rest until I have done what I have promised for you. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the place where heaven and earth meet. And that means that God's presence is not limited to Jerusalem or to the holy places of the world or to uh, the sanctuary or to the centers of power or the capitals of our nations. It means God is present wherever Jesus himself is present. That wherever Jesus, this Messiah, stands and gives a promise, there the heavens are opened and the angels of God are ascending and descending. And that means that for you, under your fig trees or wherever it is you spend your days, Jesus is with you. God is with you. The angels of God are ministering to you. Because Jesus himself has made you a promise. Jesus himself has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. Jesus himself has promised that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Jesus himself has promised that you are one of his own, that you belong to him. And Jesus himself has promised to be given to you, to be consumed by you in the sacrament of Holy Communion, in the reading of scripture, in the preaching of the word, in the promises of baptism. So that wherever you are, wherever you go, this Messiah is with you. No matter how backwater or upriver the place, no matter how messy the situation, no matter how sorrowful the day, Jesus is with you. Jesus has made his home among you. And Jesus will not leave you until he has done what he has promised to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us pray for the church, the world, and all people in need. God of the church, you have called us in the midst of the world, and in your word we find who we are. Keep us steadfast in your word, along with the whole body of Christ gathered throughout the world, that we might daily live out your calling. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all nations, all authority comes from you. Watch over police officers and firefighters, attorneys and paralegals, peacekeepers and military personnel, and the leaders of governments. See that they provide protection to all people, and especially those most vulnerable. Protect the government of our nation during this transition. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Generous God, provide for those lacking food or shelter. Console those who are sick or grieving and comfort those who are imprisoned or homebound, and all who suffer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. And God of gospel, make your promise to be heard throughout our community. Bless members, online attendees, and visitors to this congregation that they are nourished by your life-giving word. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We also lift before you these people and situations we name now, either aloud or in our hearts. Lorraine, Neva, hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. <laughs> we continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, by the leading of a star he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan you proclaimed him your beloved son, and in the miracle of water turned to wine he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <clears throat> holy, holy, holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Hosanna in 
invite you to open up the clear lid and pull out your wafer. And to hold it up as we hear Jesus' promise for the bread. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise with the cup. And again after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Uh, a couple announcements. One of them I just wrote announcement down. I wonder what that was supposed to be. Um, one of the you uh, received on the way in, or if you wanted one, a hard copy of the annual report that will also uh, be available uh, electronically. And that's, of course, for our annual meeting, which is coming up uh, in two weeks. So on the 31st, and that will be via Zoom, and instructions uh, will be posted on the website soon for that, uh, for how to join that. Um, I also want to just recognize um, our new secretary, Carrie, who has uh, undergone a trial by fire, I think, this week (laughs) in getting this annual report out to you all. So I think we should honk a little bit for Carrie, just to recognize her work. And uh, yeah, has has put put a lot of work into that this week. So, and not just this week, but also especially this week. Um, And then one other uh, handout that you received on the way in. Oh, I remember my other announcement is, before I do that one, It was written for me, special, I remember now. Uh, There's an announcement for Family Promise. Uh, So Family Promise has returned uh, to a church rotation in providing meals uh, for their residents. And so uh, Edison Lutheran, 25 residents. uh, Edison Lutheran, uh, we've signed up for February 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, and we have a Thrivent grant, which is paying for the main protein and desserts, uh, or protein and desserts are already taken care of. So we are in need of side dishes for all three nights. So again, that's February 4th, 5th, and 6th. And so if you are uh, able and interested to provide a side dish for those nights, or even just one of those nights, please contact Katie Olson. Um, so thank you for that. That's what my announcement was. All right, now there was one other thing that you received uh, regarding a piano, and I wanted to let Peter just uh, address that uh, briefly uh, as we're an opportunity uh, to purchase a new piano. Thank you, Pastor John. So if you... Can you all hear him? You guys hear okay? Okay. So I uh, recently, uh, David Benson and I have been looking into this because his, it's actually Sharon Benson, his mom's first cousin is Ray Baki. And, she, and he and Kareen are re- selling their home in Acme, it's the beautiful place that houses this magnificent piano. And he's made the piano available to our, our church for, a, a, you know, it seems like an incredible amount of money, I know, but it's, it's, it is an amazing instrument. I, I can't emphasize that, <laughs> that enough. It's a legacy piano. It's a very special piano. And I think it would, uh, Edison could make it a really fine home. So I think that um, something to pray and think about is how could this instrument help um, encourage our ministry and outreach at Edison? And it, I think you can see it, it will in many, many ways. So please think about that. And I think in, at the annual meeting, we're gonna go forward and talk about if it's something we might like to pursue. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or you have any thoughts about wanting to give to the effort, please let me or you can call Carrie at the church office and let her know. And we can just see what kind of interest is out there and see if it's something we want to go ahead with. 
Yeah, so this is a piano that's valued at $100,000. It's an excellent piano. It's in, in, it's in basically in like new condition. It's like a showroom piano. It's been humidif humidified, controlled, and heat yeah. controlled, and it's just, it's, it's in, yeah, it's, it's magnificent, so. And the, and the owners of the piano are, are receiving offers at full price for it, but they like it to go to a church that's, home, so they're willing to let us have it for half correct. price. Yeah. So. Um, but that, so that's something that we'll be talking about at the annual meeting. So I just wanted to, wanted to get some information out so that people can be thinking about it. And as Peter mentioned, you know, if this is something uh, that uh, you might be uh, feeling interested in, in uh, contributing to uh, the effort to purchase this piano, um, you know, talk to Peter, talk to Carrie, talk to me. Um, we're just getting a sense of how much interest this is and if this is something that will, uh, that maybe we're being uh, called, uh, this is an opportunity provided for us to do. Um, and then the ways that it could help our, our <laughs> community outreach once, you know, communities can come together inside <laughs> sanctuaries again, which will happen, I'm sure. Um, but so I just wanted to get that out there so that ahead of the meeting so that uh, we have an idea um, and can start thinking about that and, and wondering about that. All right, I think that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, so receive uh, the benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is indeed with you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.